He was elected chairman of the institute in May 1959. Borden's business interests were wide ranging. He founded the Wall Street investment company that bears his name and at various times was the director of Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, the CBS television network, Anova Bank, and Allied Chemical, as well as other major companies. He was also a director of American Metal, Metal Climax, a mining company with extensive holdings in Central Africa. It was a large shareholder in Rhodesian Selection Trusts, which was closely linked to the Belgian Congo and obtained much of its energy from the Congo's hydroelectric sources. Borden saw himself as a central figure in the mining world of Katanga and Belgium. Having been in the mining business as a director of American Metals Climax, he stated some years after leaving Brussels, I knew a great many people in the mining business and a great many people in the Union Minea who had direct knowledge of Congo affairs and who were much more realistic about what was likely to happen than the people in the Belgian government. And especially useful contacts said Borden in an interview in 1971 was Mr. Sengia who was the famous Union Minier man who brought the new material necessary to produce uranium to the United States in the early stages of the war, on his own initiative and at his own risk. Borden was one of a number of powerful rich men associated with the Zinoa administration who had, who had financial interest in the companies with a stake in Belgium and the Belgian Congo. Another was Christian H. Atta, the Secretary of State, who had family ties to mobile oil with direct investment in the Congo. C. Douglas Dillon, the Under Secretary of State, had family ties to Dillon, Reed and Company, which had, which had managed the Belgian Congo's bond, uh, bond issues. Thomas Gates, the Secretary of Defense, had ties to Drexel and Co. and to Morgan, and sorry, and to Morgan Guarantee Trust, which had managed two $20 million loans to the Belgian Congo. Robert Bob Murphy was the director of Morgan, Tr Morgan Guarantee Trust. Murphy, who retired from the State Department in 1959, was one of Borden's predecessors in the role of U.S. Ambassador to Belgium from 1949 to 1952. During that period, the U.S. was at war in Korea and concerned about protecting its extensive I and mean, exclusive supply of Congolese uranium, uranium uh, ore. In November 1950, Murphy visited the Congo in order to evaluate the security of the Shinkolobwe area against outside attacks. Murphy saved the U.S. a huge amount of money in 1951 over the purchase of Congolese Hall. Four years, he wrote later in his memoir, we had been able to import substantial amount of uranium ore from Katanga at prices below what was paid elsewhere. But now, Junior Minier justifiably felt it was entitled to a price increase. This amounted to a number of million dollars annually. Murphy was summoned to Washington for negotiation with Belgium. With Belgium. He suggested offering out the amount, which was accepted. There were tangible links between William Borden and the CIA. He was a director of the Farfit Foundation, the CIA front that financed, that financed such cultural organizations as the Congress for Cultural Freedom and its various projects and publications. Borden's name is listed on the foundation's letter ed. Borden was closely associated with the Museum of Modern Arts, MoMA, in New York, to which he donated valuable gifts 
of sculptures and paintings. Here, too, was a link with the CIA, which gave generous funding to MoMA. Baldwin was a trustee from 1943 and was elected as president in 1953. He was elected annually until 1959, when he resigned to go to Belgium, reprising this role after his return to New York. The museum's board was a who is who of CIA's connections, according to one commentator. Nearly everyone involved at the museum, he adds, had government connections, whether in the State Department, Foreign Service, or CIA. According to David Anfam, an authority on modern American art, the CIA was eager to support MoMA in order to promote abstract expressionism, expressionism, which was developed after the Second World War by artists such as Jackson Pollock as a foil to the Soviet realist style. It is a well-documented fact, observed in 2016, that the CIA co-opted abstract expressionism in their propaganda war against Russia. He believes that the understanding the appeal of, on, I mean, he said, I'll take that again. He believes that understanding the appeal of abstract expressionism to the CIA is easy. The artworks produced under the movement showed that America was the land of the free, whereas Russia was locked up, culturally speaking. The success of abstract expressionism also enabled New York to challenge Paris's role as the center of Western art. Gordon referred to Alan Dews, the director of the CIA under SNOA, as a lifelong friend. Dews, like Borden, had close ties with American Metal Climax. The chairman of the board of trustees of the American Metal Climax was Harold Oschild, who collaborated with the CIA in various ways, especially in Africa, and was well known to Dews. Oshad had, had been one of uh, the founders of American Melter Climax, which had started life as American Melter Company and was later known as AMAX. American Melter Climax was part of a huge network. It had mines and smelters in Africa and Mexico and the US. Company headquarters in New York, offices in other parts of the world and ships that freighted the hull. Much of the artwork belonged, sorry, much of the network belonged to the subsidiaries or affiliates or joint ventures with other corporations. All these connections came together with the foundation of African American Institute in 1953, which was put on a solid financial footing by the CIA with assistance from American Metal Climax. Views re recruited prominent businessmen to the AAI board in order to take on this responsibility as a public service in the national interest. Trustees included William Borden, Harold Oldschild, Dana Creel, later the head of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Alan Pifa, later the head of the Carnegie Corporation. The son of the Arab Oshide was Adam Oshide, who published King Leopold's Ghost in 1998. In 1986, he published Half the Way Home, a memoir of father and son about his childhood, which refers to the AAI, a new organization father had helped start, the African American Institute. In the book, Oxchild explains that his father had been chairman of his board for a decade. He then describes his father's reaction when the media revealed in the 1960s that the AAI was a CIA front. The next time I saw him, he writes, he seemed uncomfortable. He defended the link, saying that in his early years, there was nowhere else the Institute could have gotten enough money for his work, but he was clearly embarrassed. 
that the whole thing had had to be kept secret. Other members of the AI board included African-American intellectuals and writers, such as Horace Mann Bond of the CIA-funded AMSAC, Edwin S. Munger of the American University Field Staff, and Bob Keith, the chief editor of the AI's journal, Africa's Special Reports. All three men had attended the All-African People's Conference in Accra in 1958. Newly appointed as the U.S. Ambassador to Belgium in 1959, Baldwin was briefed, I'm sorry, was briefed to relevant CIA, relevant CIA activities in late September 1959. Two months later, he was concerned about the prospect of unrest in the Congo. He wrote to Dews to ask if the CIA had done any work on the degree to which new weapons, such as some of the newer gases, might be used to deal with the type of rioting occurring in the various countries of Africa, with particular reference to the Congo. The agency's Africa division provided some notes on this topic for a planned conversation between Dews and Borden. In March 1960, Ambassador Borden went on a three-week fact-finding tour of the Congo with his wife and a, and a group of Americans atta attached to the Brussels Embassy. Owen Roberts, who was a consular officer in Leopoldville in 1958 to 1960, recalled the tour some years later. It was a revelation in my belt. They had tape recorded and they had tape recorded and secretaries, extensive appointments made from Brussels, and they proceeded to analyze the whole situation in a few days. They were a big operation. Baldwin lists the members of the group in Peggy and I, but he omits one important member of the group, Larry Devlin. Devlin's chief responsibility at this time was to prepare for his forthcoming post as the CIA's chief of station in the Congo. He expected to move there at the time of independence. He had been appointed in late August 1959, following a briefing on the Congo in 1958 by Alan Dews, who was on a visit to Brussels. I was assigned to serve as his driver bodyguard, and General Man Friday, recalled Devlin's, Devlin years later. For in those times, directors traveled without an entourage. They also launched together. Dews told Devlin that the United States could not afford to lose the Belgian Congo to the Soviet Union. He impressed on me that I would be playing a key role in his plans. Devlin agreed with Dewey's, Dewey's uh, analysis. Soviet control of the Congo, he wrote in his memoir, Chief of Station, Congo, would give the Soviet Union a near monopoly on the production of cobalt, a critical mineral used in missiles and many other weapon systems, weapons systems. Since the Congo and the USSR were the world's main suppliers of the mineral, such a scenario, he argued, would put America's own weapons programs at a severe disadvantage. Cobalt, which was mined in the Congo, was indeed a strategic mineral of great value to the US. However, it was nowhere near as critical as the uranium from the Shinkolobwe mine. It is possible that Devlin was using the word cobalt as a cover for uranium, as it had been used in World War II. Congolese uranium ore had been packed in barrels marked special cobalt for the journey from Shinkolobwe to the US. Ambassador Borden, Mrs. Borden, Larry Devlin, and other members of the tour to the Congo flew from Leopoldville, Leopoldville to Lulaborg, now Kananga, 
a capital of Kasai province with Albert Kalonji, the leader of the Luba people, known as Baluba. Kalonji, who was the leader of the MNC faction that had pulled away from the Lumumba supporting branch of the party, was becoming increasingly hostile towards Lumumba. Moving on to Katanga, Baldwin's group visited some of the large mines and refineries of the Union Minea. Katanga, noted Baldwin, contained very large copper mines, very rich uranium, de uranium deposits, and important diamond mines. The general attitude of Union Minea, he added, was that despite independence, over the long things, oh, sorry, over the long run, things will work out all right, and that they will continue to show confidence in the new country by continuing to make investments and modernizing their properties. In Elizabethville, the capital of Katanga, Ambassador Borden stayed at the Union Minea guest house. Borden returned to Brussels at the start of April 1960 and made a number of recommendations to Washington. One of these was to send a top-notch ambassador to Leopoldville, since after 30th June, it would be necessary to replace the consulate general in the Congo with a fully-fledged embassy. Borden's focus, Borden's focus on, planning greatly on planning greatly impressed Devlin who thought it was one of the few people who showed any interest in the fact that the Congo was becoming independent. During the period of uh, the roundtable in Brussels, Borden obtained permission from the Belgian government to meet some of the Congolese delegates. One of these was Lumumba, whom he invited to the American embassy. Judging by Borden's report to Washington on the meeting. He disliked Lumumba at first sight and felt a personal animosity towards the younger man. The Congolese leader arrived half an hour late, said Borden. Then he kept a taxi waiting in front of the embassy for the 40 minutes or so, which was covered by our conversation. This was worth noting. He observed from the financial point of view. Lumumba was a highly articulate, sophisticated, subtle, and on principle intelligence, on, I mean, on principled intelligence, judged, boarding. He gives the impression of a man who would probably go far, he added. In spite of the facts that almost nobody trusts him. In his opinion, Lumumba was dangerously left wing. Yet Lumumba had expressed a favorable opinion of the US. This believed Borden was due in no small measure to the feeling that the American Negroes come in, come in important numbers originally from the Congo and are ends the brothers of the Congolese. Borden and Lumumba did not have a shared language in which to communicate. Borden claimed fluency in French, the official language of Belgium, along with Flemish and the official language of the Belgian Congo. But as his memoir makes clear, he struggled with French and had, to take intense, and had to take intensive lessons in order to cope with the most basic demands of diplomatic life in Brussels. But the real obstacle to any understanding between the two men was the difference in their experience, background, and attitudes. The American was rich and privileged with enhanced status in his own country because of the color of his skin, his book reflects a deeply held racism. 
the Congolese came from a poor family and was treated as a second class citizen within his own country. Also, because of the color of his skin, he was suspicious of white Belgians as a result of his experience. But he was not suspicious enough of white Americans. Frank Kalushi III, was, who was attached to the US Embassy in Leopoldville shortly after independence, described an episode that revealed the trust Lumumba initially felt in Americans as opposed to Europeans. Lumumba had misunderstood Kalushi about an issue and screamed at him. You Europeans are all you hypocrites. You promised me. Shortly afterwards, Kalushi asked Lumumba why he had screamed at him. Lumumba replied, I didn't realize you were, you were an American. I thought you were European. Larry Devlin suggests in his memoir that he himself was less concerned about the color of an individual's skin than with the individual's potential to advance his professional objectives. And unlike Borden, Devlin spoke French fluently. His wife, Paulette, was a French woman he had met in Algiers during the World War II when they were both engaged in intelligence work. Devlin was therefore able to converse with Congolese people who spoke French, but he did not learn any of the Congolese's 242 languages, including Lingala, Kiswahili, Kikungo, and Keluba. One of the contacts Devlin established in Brussels during the roundtable was with uh, Victor Nendaka, an ambitious politician who paid a visit to the American embassy on his own accord without an invitation. Nendaka had previously been the vice president of MNCL, but by the time of the roundtable, he had left Lumumba's group for MNCK. According to Devlin, Nendaka went to the embassy and warned the political officer that Lumumba was already working closely with the Soviets. The officer, aware of my future assignment in the Congo, introduced me to Nendaka. Devlin was grateful for this introduction, although Nendaka had no experience in intelligence. Devlin wrote years later, he proved to be a quick learner. He was self-taught and had a brilliant mind. Nendaka's wife told Devlin that when they were first married, he preferred to stay home and read books rather than going out to dance and drink beer. Now, as the Congo prepared for independence, Nendaka, was an ideal contact for, Devlin's, for Devlin. He recognized that American support was essential to the success of the new government and started to cultivate the most important officials in our embassy as I began to focus on him. The result was that we eventually became close friends. This friendship was to have huge ramifications for the Congo after independence. Ambassador Borden gave a reception in Brussels in January 1960 for the Congolese men attending the round table. One of the guests was Joseph Desire Mobutu. I met him, said Devlin, many years later. As I met a number of the leaders after the end of the round table conference, when Ambassador Borden gave a reception, at the reception, he added, we each took the names of X number. I don't remember how many of Congolese and tried to get an idea of who they were, if they were intelligent, competent. Because what we had up until that time were assessments provided by the Belgians. 
From this indicated Delvin, I mean Devlin, emerged the connection with Mobutu. The reaction was that here is a man who is a strong nationalist, intelligent, and who seems to have leadership qualities along with others. For several of the others, the reaction was rather negative. This was not truthful, since Mobutu was already serving Devlin as an informer. There was widespread suspicion of Mobutu in Congolese circles during the roundtable. It was widely believed that he had been an informer in the way in the pay of Belgium from the late 1950s. Jeff Van Bilsen, who was at the round table as an advisor to Abako, personally warned Lumumba that Mobutu was working as an informer. He pointed out that this made MNCL vulnerable. Given Mobutu's prominent role in the party, Lumumba responded that he was already aware of this and that it was an innocent way 